Since automated grow spaces in the cannabis community are becoming so popular lately, I wanted to see for myself how some of this new technology is holding up. That's why in this video, I'm gonna be setting up the VGrow Smart Grow Box by Vivo Sun and putting some of this new technology to the test. In doing so, I'm gonna be detailing my experience with some of the built-in features, such as the self-watering reservoir, the lighting system, all the way to the smart environmental monitoring, which can all be controlled from an app on your phone. So this is definitely gonna be a bit of a change of pace for the channel. Uh, of course, in this video, we're also gonna be talking about mainlining cannabis plants, which is a high stress training method we used for this grow to help increase the plant yields. Uh, additionally, we'll briefly be touching on topics such as plant lighting, pistol development and flower, cocoa versus soil as a medium, uh, and also issues you might run into using salt-based fertilizers such as nutrient lockout, uh, along with just a general rundown of what you can expect week by week of the flower cycle when you're growing a photo period strain like we'll be doing today. So um, with, with all of that out of the way, let's just jump right into it. All right, so first things first, we're gonna start by mixing up the medium we'll be using to grow our cannabis plant with today. Now the Vivo Sun Kit really does come with everything we need to get started, including some cocoa and even the nutrients. However, we decided we'll be making our own mix of premium coconut coir substrate and perlite, and we're only gonna be mixing a small amount since we're only working with this three gallon fabric pot. So overall, we mixed roughly 30% perlite with 70% cocoa coir. Now when choosing to grow in cocoa as opposed to soil, there are a few pros and cons to keep in mind to gain a better understanding of what really is gonna work best for your particular situation. In my case, the main reason I favor cocoa is simply for the faster growth rates. Since it is highly porous, meaning a vast majority of its volume is made up of air, it provides excellent aeration and water retention, leading to roots developing a lot faster faster uh, as opposed to soil which does have a lot slower growth rates since less oxygen is able to make its way down to the roots. However, that's not to say that soil is a bad choice. Again, it kind of just depends on what your priorities are when growing. If you're someone who isn't able to do daily waterings and you just want more of a low maintenance option, soil is probably gonna be the better choice since it's more dense and retains water for much longer. Uh, moreover, soil is the more beginner-friendly option since it acts as a buffer, making it more forgiving with nutrient and pH imbalances. So. Yeah, those are just a few of the things to consider when choosing what medium to go with, but ultimately, like I said earlier, we're just going with cocoa this time around for the faster growth rates. Now, in regard to nutrients, we are gonna be trying Vivo Sun's very own lineup, which is included uh, in the VGrow kit. And it's basically just a simple two-part formula with pre-recommended measurements right on the bottle. So we're gonna be following those to a T. Okay, so this time around, we did decide to pop some seeds known as Banana Daddy R1. Now this strain by Ethos Genetics is an eight to nine week photo period that was crossed between Granddaddy Perp and Banana Hammock R1. Now, according to Ethos, this strain is averaging 25 to 30% total cannabinoids and has a terpene profile that's been described as fruity and gassy all at the same time, which those two together is just kind of the flavor I've been after for a while now. So again, I'm kind of, Pretty excited for this one. Now, I have personally had a pretty good track record with Ethos strains in the past with my favorite so far being Planet of the Grapes. Uh, honorable mentions to White Wedding and, and Grape Diamonds as well. But if you're just looking for like a hard hitting straight gas with some fruity undertones and really crazy trichome production, then I would, I would recommend Planet of the Grapes out of all the Ethos strains I've tried so far. But uh, yeah, with, with that being said, Banana Daddy is the strain we'll be going with for this video. And to be honest, uh, it started out a little rough right out the jump. Okay, so today's the first day of officially planting the popped seed. It's finally germinated. I've had two duds out of this Banana Daddy pack so far, which is why things got delayed. It's the first time I've had an Ethos pack with any duds in it so far, so um, to have two of them is kind of crazy, but yeah, today's the day um, planting the seed and uh, I'm setting up the drip irrigation system because we're not gonna be using the self-watering pot thing here. It's, uh, it's not something we're interested in, but yeah. Aside from that, I am gonna be using some nutrients right out of the gate. I have uh, a gallon of water I just put in here, pH, and then uh, I'm gonna be doing one milliliter per gallon of water for each of the, the base A and base B nutrients from Vivo Sun. So that's how we're gonna start it out. We're gonna increase as we go, but yeah, this marks it officially day one of the Banana Daddy. 
We even got a little Vivo Sun planting tools to get started. So it's really a, a Vivo Sun grow from head to toe. Now, since we are growing in a mixture of cocoa and perlite, the goal here is just gonna be to keep the soil moist at all times. Personally, we find that high frequency waterings works best for this method of hydroponic growing, meaning that you'll want more frequent small irrigations to help facilitate faster growth rates. Um, that being said, we did wanna follow Vivo Sun's recommendations to a T, so we decided to just use their watering instructions, which means feeding the plants once per day. Now the Vivo Sun app controls every aspect of this grow, so we'll be starting by programming the drip feed emitter to water the plants 200 milliliters over the duration of five minutes per day. Of course, we will increase the increment and uh, the time limits of the feed when the plant transitions into both veg and flower as per Vivo Sun's recommendations, but for now, it's just 200 milliliters, uh, takes five minutes to do. All right, now since we are in the seedling stage, we're gonna be setting the light schedule to 18 hours on and six hours off, which will continue into veg. Uh, however, the light spectrum at this point in time is going to be emitting a lot more blues throughout the seedling stage, as opposed to when we're in flower and the light is gonna be emitting a predominantly red light. Now exposing the plant to higher levels of blue light in the seedling stage directly mimics what the plant would be experiencing in its natural environment. And that's because in the spring and early summer, we typically get longer days with clear skies, making blue light more prominent throughout these seasons. This increase in blue light during the seedling stage helps boost chlorophyll production, which is super important for photosynthesis since it helps the seedling produce the energy it's gonna be needing for robust growth. Uh, moreover, blue light is proven to help promote shorter internodal spacing, which ultimately results in compact plants with sturdy stems, uh, exactly what we're gonna want for the chunky colas that we're gonna be growing in this video. Okay, so as we push into the early veg stage of plant life, we're planning on doing a high stress training technique known as mainlining, which is also referred to as manifolding. Now, I don't wanna go into too much detail about this training method uh, since we actually uploaded an entire video detailing the what, why, when, where, and how, but um, I'll, I'll just briefly give an overview of what we did and our reasons behind doing so. So in short, mainlining cannabis plants simply refers to the act of topping the plant on several occasions with the end goal being to multiply the amount of main colas while keeping them flush with one another. Now the reason we decided to use this training technique is because this smart box, super small, only 18 by 18 inches in diameter with a standing height of four feet. So more than any other grow we've done on the channel so far, we really just need a super dense canopy um, if we want any kind of respectable yield and, and we can't afford to have these plants stretching out at all. And, and you know, mainlining kind of tackles both of those issues simultaneously. All right, to get started with the manifold, we're going to wait until the plant is five nodes in height, top down to the third node, and then remove all of the growth beneath this point. Once the plants bounce back, it will have sprouted two new main branches from the third node where we initially cut. At this point, we are now gonna top each new branch to the third node, remove the growth beneath, and again, wait for the plant to grow back, which it takes roughly two weeks each time. Same as before, the amount of main branches will have multiplied this time from two to four, uh, and, and you could continue on from four to eight and eight to 16 if you want you know, a, a wider canopy. Uh, I should mention before we move on, tying down the branches is an important step to manifolding uh, as it helps the plant get adequate light exposure to all of the nodes. Again, we do have a separate video detailing the entire process, so make sure to check that out if you're interested in learning more about mainlining cannabis plants. Okay, so altogether, this plant vegged out for just over one month before we decided to switch it into its flowering cycle. Now the Vivo Sun feeding instructions say we should be feeding anywhere from five to nine milliliters of both base A and base B per gallon of water. So we decided to start at five milliliters at the beginning of veg, uh, and pretty much every time the reservoir emptied, we increased the feedings by one milliliter. So by the end of veg, we were up to nine milliliters of nutrient solution per gallon of water and this did seem to work pretty well for us. I should mention that we did flush the plants with plain water midway through veg just to assure we didn't get any kind of salt buildup. But again, uh, I'll talk about all the salt buildup and, and nutrient lockout stuff a little later on in the video. 
All right, so it was roughly 12 days before we switched the plant over into the flowering cycle that we decided to throw a trellis netting in the tent to help maintain a more even canopy. Now the V-Grow box actually comes with all of the attachments needed to do so, and I must say, super convenient and easy to set up. Essentially, you just have these metal clip-ons with magnetized hooks, which make raising and lowering the trellis netting a lot simpler than tying one up on our own, which is what we usually do. So uh, shout out to Vivo Sun for that. Okay, once we get into the first few weeks of flower, we're really going to be depending on tucking the shoots under the netting to help prevent the plant from getting too tall, since the first two to four weeks of flower is typically when we'll see the plant stretching up towards the light. Now this is mostly influenced by plant hormones, which is completely normal when the plant starts to bloom its flower. Though I should mention that the amount of stretch can vary depending on genetics. Typically sativa strains will stretch up in height a lot more than indicas. So in the case you're growing a sativa uh, and don't have a whole lot of vertical grow space, you'll likely be doing a lot more plant training to help manage the stretch. However, um, Banana Daddy that we're working with is an indica dominant strain. So we're not gonna be worrying too much about that stuff. Um, so I'm not really going to be touching on a lot of that in this video. Okay, so now that we're in the first week of flower, we'll once again be increasing the watering amount through the app. At this point, the plant will be reaching 1,400 milliliters of water per day, and that amount takes exactly 35 minutes for the drip feed emitter to discharge. So currently the timer is set so that the feeding starts every morning at 9.30 a.m. and ends at 10.05. Uh, and I personally just feel like it's better to schedule these feedings earlier on in the day as opposed to later, since the medium will become drier when the lights are on as opposed to when they're off and the temperatures kind of cool down. Uh, this can leave too much moisture in the medium when it comes close to lights out time, which overall may increase humidity levels in the tent, which can have negative effects such as contributing to the development of powder mildew. And, and being as the both of us live here in Toronto, uh, which is a more humid climate this time of the year anyway, it, it can often just be a bit of a pain keeping these levels where they need to be. So that, that coupled with how cramped this tiny little grow space is, maintaining the humidity level this time is more important than ever. Really don't want to risk getting any powder mildew in there. So there's that. All right, so as we push into week two of the flower cycle, we begin to notice white pistils starting to form on the flower. Uh, I actually remember being a kid and thinking these hairs on the nug is what got you high, but now <laughs> being in my 30s, I know that was kind of counterproductive, being as there is no THC whatsoever in the pistols. So, But yeah, with that being said, I just wanted to kind of briefly touch on, uh, you know, what exactly are these little hairs, what we call pistols, and what do they contribute to the plant? Well, in nature, the pistils are produced exclusively by the female plant as a means of reproduction. When male plants release pollen into the air, the female plant captures the pollen grains with these pistils, which ultimately fertilizes the plant and begins the process of seed development. Uh, moreover, the pistils can actually be used as a visual marker for maturity of the plant, uh, and it's actually uh, a way that some people decide when they want to harvest their plants. Uh, for example, in early flower, you'll notice that the pistils are, are more white in color, which indicates the plant is still immature and not ready to be harvested. However, once you're in the later stages of flower, the hairs will change to be more orange or red in color. Uh, and this is usually a good sign that the flower has produced its optimal amount of cannabinoids and is ready to be harvested. However, if you start noticing that the hairs are turning a more brown color, this means that the plants are getting uh, overly mature, which simply put uh, will result in a less potent flower. So you, you wanna make sure you harvest them around that orange red color kind of time frame. So it was around the end of week four for us when we really noticed that the plant had stopped stretching towards the light and we're starting to notice a big shift in bud development. From this point on, the plant's gonna be focusing a majority of its energy on thickening of the buds as well as trichome production. Now, usually when I'm not using a carbon filter, this is typically the point in plant life when I start to notice that cannabis smell really getting out of hand. Uh, and that definitely was the case this time around. I, my, my entire apartment was just dank and like sweet banana gas. Uh, and that's certainly one improvement the Vigro Smart Box could make is maybe getting a carbon filter in there. Just, you know, because it is a little overwhelming for some people. I like it though, but yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> I just thought I would mention that. Okay, being that we mainline these plants, there is gonna be no need for lollipopping or really any other forms of plant training at the moment. 
um, as we already just have huge main colas across the top canopy with little to no popcorn nugs developing, so all of the space really is going to good use. Aside from some trichomes forming and a slight purpling of the leaves, uh, not much has really changed for this plant, and everything seems to be going well so far. Okay, so it wasn't actually until the final few weeks of flower when we started to notice uh, a crispy browning of the corners on some of the leaves. Now this could be symptoms of a potential nutrient lockout, but since we haven't been testing the PPM of our nutrient solution uh, or, or the runoff, it's kind of hard to say that this is specifically the cause, but uh, nonetheless, we still think this might be the primary reason we're seeing a decline in the plant's health. So ultimately we opted to flush the medium since nutrient lockout, if left untreated, can stunt the plant's growth uh, and ultimately lead to smaller yields and reduced potency. So uh, addressing this issue is, is super important. So with that in mind, I wanted to briefly talk about uh, what exactly can cause nutrient lockout in cannabis plants since we, we kind of think we're facing it now. Now, in short, nutrient lockout occurs when a plant is unable to absorb certain kinds of nutrients from the growing medium, even though they're present. Salt-based nutrients in particular are very concentrated, and when applied, the salts can build up in the root zone. If the accumulation becomes too much, it can ultimately affect the plant's ability to take up other nutrients. Lockout can also occur if your plant is unable to uptake nutrients due to pH imbalances, but we know that that's just not the issue here as our pH has been within a stable range. So at this point, we wanted to flush the system with water that has a pH balance of 5.8. Uh, and being as we're already so close to the end of flower, we decided to just completely lay off nutrients and just stick with the plain waterings uh, before we harvest the plants. Now that is not necessary as they probably could have just been given more nutrients after flushing, but we decided to just stick with plain water. So there's hopefully a nice fade going on when this grow finishes up. But yeah, we're definitely not gonna be finishing as strong as we would have liked to. Uh, it would have been nice. I, we probably should have flushed the plants just out of caution earlier on in the flowering cycle, but it is what it is. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, the pistils changing in color from white to orange is one indication that the plants are ready to be harvested. To be safe though, we do like to use a microscope to check and make sure a majority of the trichomes have changed from translucent uh, to being more amber in color. Once that happens, we typically cut down the plants and hang them up to dry. Now we usually do section off the plant and hang it in a, in a dry tent, but this time around we decided to just hang the entire plant in a cold room uh, since it is the perfect environment in there being 60 degrees Fahrenheit with 60% humidity. Uh, so unfortunately, there's really not uh, a lot of footage of us drying and trimming this plant. So uh, in lieu of that, roughly 50 days after the weed had cured in this grove bag, um, we decided to just sit down and do a final weigh-in, discuss some of the pros and cons of using the V-Grow Smart Grow Box, uh, and then we ultimately gave our final verdict on the Banana Daddy R1. So for any of you who are interested in seeing that footage, just make sure to drop a comment down below and maybe we'll do like a post bud review video for this banana daddy r1 because it is probably one of the better strains we've grown in a while but uh yeah anyway i appreciate you guys watching the videos as always uh until next time on canadian grower peace